So I just added to my meta position on Friday. And the main reason? Because Mark Zuckerberg has just turned into a chat. Of course, that's just a joke. But anyhow, specifically in this video, I'm just going to dive a little bit deeper into how I understand their most recent earnings and provide you with my own thinking framework on why I added, um, what are the valuations and my calculations around Meta stock today, and more importantly, uh, maybe provide you with a different reference point if, let's say, you are sitting on the fence, thinking on whether you should buy Meta stock or not. Now, I think just an overview, we have seen many headlines um, saying that, oh, Meta stock, right after their earnings, they have dropped 19%, 20%, wiping out $200 billion in market cap. But just to ground you in reality, on a year-to-date basis, a Meta Platforms is still up a whopping not 10, not 20, a whopping 28%. Uh, the S&P 500, closer to 7%. And also to talk to you briefly about my relationship with Meta stock, um, this is not my first video and I doubt that it will be the last video. So I believe that I've actually created more than 10, 15, even 20 videos on Meta over the last one to two years. But as you can see, um, at least based on the date of upload, um, it's around one year ago, two years ago, um, based on my analysis and specifically during the period, um, especially the trying period when Meta stock was delivering um, disastrous numbers and many people and questioning whether Meta even have a future. And back then, I've also written a Substack article that was closer to three to 4,000 words, um, basically outlining and detailing my entire investment thesis, the problems around Meta, my valuation, um, the mode, etc, etc. And um, right now, I'm looking into or deep diving into another company. So if you're interested, um, the link is down below. You can join the Substack email list. So some of you might ask, oh, why is there a lack of updates? You should be parading around telling people that, oh, how right you are on Meta platforms when you're telling people that it was an opportunity to buy. I think first things first, to put it frankly, when I was making the videos, Meta was trading right around the 180 to $200 range. And when I wrote that Substack article, Meta was at 161. And right after my publication, Meta actually went down by another 50% to right around $88 to $90 per share. So of course, if you were to ask me, was my conviction being tested? Sure, I mean, if you put in a part of your portfolio and the stock proceeded to tank by another 30, 40, 50%, you will definitely question your conviction and your own analysis and more importantly, whether you made a wrong judgment. But that said, I still continued holding on. Um, I was still creating content around it. It's just purely from an allocation perspective. Meta was closer to 2 to 3% of my portfolio, while the rest of my other positions took a much bigger allocation. That's why I spent a lot more time on the other positions. And I think one important point to note is that the stock actually rallied relatively quickly from its lows after the flash crash from 90, and essentially like triple or quadruple um, from its lows. So the funny thing that I've observed, especially for the audiences on YouTube, is that they treat YouTubers like they are free therapists. Um, it's a free therapy session um, telling you that, oh, it's all okay, guys. Um, we should diamond hands. The fundamentals are still doing okay. The market is irrational. And you need somebody constantly reminding you. Meta rebounded so quickly. That's why there wasn't a need for such a content. And also, um, there was not a lot of exciting development on my part. Um, you see that on the first slide, I actually averaged down to 160 and then I stopped. I didn't buy in. I didn't sell out. So they were executing great over the last four to six quarters. Um, the numbers look pretty good, so there was not much to cover on my side. And I think that other YouTubers are doing a fairly good job. But that's it, um, specifically for this video, I've added to my meta position. So let's uncover what's my thought process behind it. Now, I think this is just an overview of its most recent segment results. So you can see that year on year, um, total revenue actually increased from 28.6 to 36.4. Um, Reality Labs revenue, 339 to 440 million. But that said, um, operating loss um, still slowly inching up, albeit not a step up in terms of operating losses, but still a 3.8 billion hole um, that has to be funded from somewhere else. But Meta's operating margins has recovered exponentially from 25% to 38%. And some high-level figures, um, revenue up 27%, costs and expenses only up 6%, meaning that they're reaping um, a lot of efficiencies. Their income from operations are up 91%, um, net income was up 117%. So all these numbers, extremely spectacular. Nothing to complain. So family daily active people at 3.24 billion users, I'm not too sure where they're getting all these people. Um, I presume that there's a lot of scammers creating accounts on Meta, but I guess the attention real estate on Meta's family of apps is still incredible. Advertisers are still seeing the returns on ad spend, so everything is fine and dandy. 
Um, the average price per ad on a worldwide basis is up 6% year on year. You can see that at least over the last four quarters, they have been in a negative trend, but we are slowly um, coming out of that cycle. Weibo has introduced a new method that allows investors to focus on the long term, remove emotions from the picture via a regular savings plan. The main benefit, it's all automated. It helps you save both time and energy for things that matter in your life. So WeBoost RSP currently supports US listed stocks, ETF, and SGD USD denominated mutual funds. So here's how you do it. All you need to do is to first choose either a US stock, ETF, or mutual fund that you wish to invest over a period of time. Set the amount, select your payment method, and the frequency of each interval. So simple as that. And that is how you build your portfolio automatically for the long term. So if you're new to Weibo, they have a really attractive transfer in promotion and sign up campaign to welcome you to the platform. So all the details to their campaigns will be in the link down below. So sign up with the link and join Weibo to explore great benefits today. Thank you Weibo for sponsoring this video. So ad impressions delivered across the family of apps increased by 20% year on year. So capital expenditure was 6.72 billion, capital return program, the share buyback was 14.6 billion, and the dividend was 1.27 billion. By the grander scheme of things, if you really think about it, Meta's market cap is closer to $1.1 trillion. So all these capital returns, buying back shares, dividend, um, it's minuscule in the grander scheme of things. Cash and cash equivalent, um, 58 billion, it's a fortress of a balance sheet nothing much to worry about. It's a year of efficiency and Mark Zuckerberg is executing on it. Now, in terms of its free cash flow profile on a Q1 year-on-year -year basis, $6.9 billion to $12.5 billion per quarter. And if you do look at it on a trailing 12-month basis, just adding them up, 11 plus 13, 24, um, 35, 45, 47, 47, 48 billion dollars. 48 billion dollars in free cash flow. Um, taking into account a $1.1 trillion market cap, um, they are trading right around 22 times. So the opening remarks from Mark Zuckerberg, it's been a good start to the year. The new version of Meta AI with Llama 3 is another step towards building the world's leading AI. We are seeing healthy growth across our apps and we continue making steady progress building the metaverse as well. I think many people are asking, oh, if Meta posts such great numbers, why did the stock still tank by 19, 20%, losing $200 billion in market cap? Firstly, I think it's just the picture that was drawn by Mark Zuckerberg, which is the leader and the main executive of Meta platforms. He leads the way and he charted the future of Meta forward. So the picture provided by Zuck was that um, he really talked a lot about expenditure. It's a multi-year cycle. They're gonna spend XXX billion dollars. And of course, um, his constant obsession with the metaverse. If you look through the earnings transcript, in the first part, he's talking about the core business. And on the second part, he continues talking about um, the Ray-Bans, how much money they're spending, um, they're looking or they're being very optimistic about the metaverse, etc., etc. Even though um, they're not producing any results and investors are basically bleeding out in the meantime because they don't see any forms of returns from the metaverse investment. Secondly, I think in terms of the CFO guidance, they increased CAPEX spending from a guidance of 30 to $37 billion to 35 to $40 billion. It's to accelerate infrastructure investments to support the AI roadmap. And they're expecting this AI CAPEX to be a multi-year investment. So they're not slowing down their investment cycle. In fact, it might even just be the start. I think it's worth calling out that we have historically seen a lot of volatility in our stock during this phase of our product playbook where we are investing in scaling a new product but aren't yet monetizing it. So we saw this with reuse, stories, as news feeds transition to mobile and more. And I also expect to see a multi-year investment cycle before we have fully scaled meta AI, business AIs, and more into the profitable services I expect as well. And the initial signs are quite positive here. But building the leading AI will also be a larger undertaking than the other experiences we have added to our apps. And this is likely going to take several years. I mean, it seems like at least Wall Street or investors are all focused on the first part, which is looking at the volatility and the amount of money spent. Um, Meta or Mark Zuckerberg was not as charismatic as Elon Musk, um, saying that autonomy will be worth um, the entire company combined. But I think Mark Zuckerberg, if you read between the lines, did say that 
Um, this is a larger undertaking than all the other experiences we have added to our apps. So if they are able to execute on this vision, I do believe that Meta's AI engine, it's going to bring a new paradigm shift um, to how investors are going to look at the growth and the margins for Meta moving forward because of the sheer value add that they bring to the platform and the economy itself. Now, moving on to the two core pillars that I think investors are not paying enough attention. It's at its core, it's the Meta AI engine. But the first part is AI for retention, and the second part is AI for advertisers. Now, if we look at AI for retention, the core focus and objective is simple. Maximize attention on all matters real estate. So they did cite a few figures in the earnings call itself. So 30% of the posts on Facebook feeds are delivered by AI recommendation, 2x over the last couple of years. Currently, more than 50% of the content people see on Instagram is AI recommended. They're also increasing the monetization efficiency through two prongs. Firstly, it's optimizing the level of ads. And secondly, it's enhancing marketing performance. So when we talk about optimizing level of ads, it's basically a matters AI engine, understanding you as a consumer behavior and knowing when to target you and at which point on time and how they're able to balance the content versus advertising ratio um, based on how you consume, what's your consumption pattern and how you interact with with many of these social media platforms. On top of that, they're able to deliver the right ads at the right time to the right audience. And more importantly, they have recently deployed a new model which saw an 8 to 10% increase in watch time. And I think long story short, um, based on the picture that is painted by the senior executive, um, they are achieving their objective, which is to maximize attention and to accrue much more real estate. Now, moving on to AI for advertisers, let's also not forget um, the users, the end users like you and me, um, we are the product. The main customers of Meta platforms is actually the advertisers. And there's two bullet points that I think it's very undervalued or people are not really waking up to its potential. Firstly, it's really the idea of an outsized adoption of image expansion with small businesses for ad creation. So it's a lot about generative AI for many of these small businesses to harness the skill set because they don't have a very bloated cost structure. They can't hire designers, they can't hire um, editors, etc, etc. So this new AI capability is slowly eating to the lunch of creatives and designers in the longer run. They can A-B test quicker, um, they can test different ads, they can reduce campaign costs, and most importantly, if Meta is able to continue adding to its capabilities, all these are going to accrue to the bottom line of the advertisers. And in this case, I'm going to make them much more profitable so that they can spend much more money on Meta, achieving a win-win situation in the longer run. So it's basically on business messaging, shopping use cases, queries, etc. So WhatsApp, um, I believe many people are saying that it's criminally under monetized. It seems like they're finally waking up. So under the other segment, it's up 85% year on year driven by business messaging revenue growth from WhatsApp business. So I think this two part, it's still underappreciated right now, which is why I'm even more bullish, or I'm even more excited to actually add to my meta position. So to me, I look at Zuckerberg with a great deal of admiration. So time and time again, we have seen Zuck's leadership in navigating uncertain times, specifically in the most recent one, which is flexing his muscle on the workaround with Apple's recent and iOS updates. They have basically just spent a crazy ton of money, train out an AI model and just work around many of these iOS changes. And at this current juncture, he has once again told investors to basically trust me, bro, in this new investment cycle. Now, the justification of spending so much money must be commensurate with the return on capital. And with the recent sell down, it seems like investors are calling out on this misallocation of capital. But to me, in the grander scheme of things, I'm not that worried in terms of his investments. But my biggest worry is when the music stops playing, we go into a recessionary cycle and advertising is still a pretty cyclical industry. So you have to be prepared um, and to look at the risk reward and how it fits your entire portfolio allocation. And now because of the new guidance from management, um, I have to go back to my model and to readjust my assumptions again. The biggest change that I've made to this model is actually in terms of the CAPEX front. So we've already been given the heads up by Meta platforms that they're going to spend an incredible amount of money. And in this most recent um, financial year, they're going to bump it up to 35 to 40 billion, bump the entire CAPEX expenditure to closer to 40 billion dollars. So I've slightly bumped up the growth rate in terms of the cash from operations because I'm looking at Mark Zuckerberg's execution thus far. I think in terms of their efficiency, um, optimization of the business, it looks pretty promising. So for 2024, I'm expecting an 18% increase and um, I just flatline it 12% to 10% in 2028. So for CAPEX, they have already alluded that it's a multi-year investment cycle. 45% for 2024 to hit the 40 billion. And from there on, I'm growing it out at 25, 25, 15, 15. So I think this is a fair estimate because we are already reaching unprecedented numbers, um, at least in terms of Meta's history in spending in capital expenditure. We are already hitting all-time highs. So I think growing at this kind of clip 
it's quite scary. But in terms of trying to be conservative, I think it's good because if Meta surprise us on the downside, meaning if they spend lesser money, um, a lot of these are accrual to shareholder. In terms of their free cash flow terminal multiple, I use a 25 times, which is much closer to historical value. So I use the discounting of 10% and I got the price target of around 490. So when I change this to 20, 22 times, 25 times, um, I get a price target or price range of between $420 to $500 per share. So right now, if you don't ask me, adding at $440, you are basically buying at fair value. So why am I buying at fair value? Don't I want a margin of safety? I think it's really dependent on investor. To me, because I've entered Meta at a much lower cost price, I don't mind adding to the position, even though it's quote-unquote fair value territory. I want to own more of this spectacular business. And Basically, I believe in Mark Zuckerberg's vision in terms of this AI investment cycle. So long story short, I just want to own more. For myself, Meta actually went to 2.8% of my portfolio on cost and 5.8% on value. My average cost right now is closer to $217 per share. My game plan, um, hopefully I'm able to add more. Um, I'm slowly nibbling. So I'm not necessarily saying that this is an opportunity of a lifetime, but I think paying fair value for a stock like Meta is okay. And if there's even more recessionary scares moving forward and Meta continues to correct downwards, I'll be more than excited to buy more shares. So on a side note, I also wanted to update you guys that this is my account overview for IBKR. I've managed to extract um, the performance. I've started this in the April of 2023. So I've been close to, I guess, 13 months now. Um, I believe I didn't outperform the S&P 500. Um, I'm close to it now. And let's see, in the next five years or so, am I able to beat the S&P 500. So for this portfolio specifically, 50% um, is give or take is allocated to China. I think the rest of the 40% is in US and 10% is in Singapore. So this is much more diversified in nature. Now, if you look at uh, my Tiger Brokers, where I mostly hold my China positions or Chinese positions, um, on a year-to-date basis, it's performed quite well. But if you look at it on a much longer track record over the last two to three years, they basically model the Hang Seng Index. And as you all know, um, the Hang Seng hasn't been performing well for the last two to three years. But ironically or surprisingly, at least in 2024, um, for those of you who actually do follow Hong Kong names like um, the Chinese banks, um, some of the Chinese names that I have, um, Tencent, um, Hai Di Lao, all these have appreciated quite a bit. But my biggest position, which is Alibaba, um, they haven't been doing much. Um, they are flat year to date. So I'm looking forward to seeing how um, Hong Kong is going to perform in 2024. And last but not least, um, Weibo. Um, Weibo is mostly, or at least all of it, is my US position when I bought back in 2022. So you can see that the PNL is quite spectacular because I've been buying or accumulating some of these good names or good companies in 2022. So I hope you guys enjoyed the discussion and I think this year has been pretty kind to me after the last two years of um, brutality and I hope you guys have been doing well and I'll see you guys in the next video but more importantly, I will see you guys on the moon. Goodbye!